Hi, I'm Doug. I'm here with Sawyer Moranville, and we want to encourage you in studying the biblical languages. <laughs> Sawyer, we're talking today. It's January 2024, snowy, cold day where I'm at in Virginia. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. There's a lot of snow on the ground outside as well over here. Um, it's, uh, yeah, good to be with you. My wife uh, and daughter are outside sledding. They can't be having as much fun as we are, though, because <laughs> we're talking right. about the biblical languages, and that's the best thing ever. But I would love to be outside with them, but we got a whole day ahead of us. So <laughs> with you. thank you for allowing me on your on your show today. Well, thanks for joining us today. Now, you are with Lingua Deo Gloria, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Lingua Deo Gloria. Uh, this is a ministry that we want to turn into a nonprofit, 501c3, within the coming year. Um, we're already doing a lot of things and publishing books. And even today, I start our first live video classes for free um, through Zoom. And so I'm very excited about that. And what are you teaching in those classes? Um, in these classes, so this is uh, kind of an experimental stage. I'm going to be starting with Biblical Hebrew. Um, in Biblical Hebrew classes, I have one on Tuesday, one on Saturday. They last about an hour and a half. They'll last for 12 weeks. And I'm going to be teaching Biblical Hebrew by using hopefully four senses. I guess technically five because visual. Um, right. So speaking Hebrew, listening to Hebrew, um, reading and writing Hebrew, but also I think acting such a beautiful part of language pedagogy. And so the students will be watching me uh, teach as well. And so I, I, I guess we could say five senses in that in that sense. And uh, so it's it's very exciting. I've I've taught Hebrew uh, for quite a while, but I'm excited to branch out on my own through Lingua Deo Gloria and start teaching um, as a ministry to the church. Well, that's great. It's neat to hear your passion for the biblical languages here, and can't go wrong with uh, starting off with some some good biblical Hebrew there. Mm -hmm. Now, before we talk maybe a little bit more about what you're doing uh, with your ministry, could you talk to us a bit about why? Uh, why did you decide to study the biblical languages? What what motivates you? Uh, perhaps providence, uh, perhaps genetics, and um accident as well i've always been passionate about the things that um i enter into so when it when i was younger it used to be weightlifting and sports um and then i grew up and i hurt myself through a number of experiences uh you know not having good form in sports and so i kind of harmed myself physically and so i transitioned away from uh weightlifting for instance and then uh, I, I eventually, when I became a Christian, when I was in college, I started studying the Bible and um, I put all my passion into that. And um, from there, I ended up going to seminary. And in seminary, it's required uh, to learn the biblical languages uh, to get an MDiv where I went. And so I started learning Greek because I uh, was required to, but it turned into a passion. And through that, I realized that actually there's a lot of uh, my family members who have a lot of history with language learning, both modern and ancient. And so I, I almost wonder if there's a little bit of genetics involved in it as well. Uh, you know, no joke. My grandmother was a language teacher. My uncle, you know, knows Mandarin and Portuguese and uh, flies all across the globe. And uh, my my other uncle was an ancient Greek student for a while in college. So, uh, you know, it, it came, uh, you know, maybe through genetics, providence, but also it came as as a passion to serve the church of Jesus Christ. I love the word of God and wanted to teach it more faithfully and understand it more accurately. And so uh, that's uh, kind of a scattered discussion or introduction to how I got into biblical Hebrew and biblical Greek. Well, that's great. And biblical Hebrew, biblical Greek, have you also studied biblical Aramaic? Uh, yes, I formally studied uh, biblical Aramaic when I was in uh, Israel or Aramaic in general. Uh, some of the Targums we read over uh, Targum Onkelos in Genesis and uh, Neophyte. And um, yeah, I'll be doing some more uh, Aramaic in the future. I'm really excited to continue to uh, study Aramaic as well. And so, yeah, I, I've dabbled in Aramaic and I want to 
jump into it more. So Right. That, that's awesome. Um, I, I don't know about you, but a lot of folks I run into, if they've gone to seminary, they've often done something with Hebrew and Greek, but uh, rarely uh, it seems like Aramaic unless they're in a university setting. Is that is that similar to your experience as well? Yeah, I would say so. Um, actually, at the seminary that I went to, when I was there, you couldn't even find an Aramaic course. You can now. There's a, another professor who has showed up, from what I understand, after I left, uh, who teaches Aramaic over there now. But it's very difficult in some places to find Aramaic teachers, um, right. which I think is sad, but it's understandable because, you know, Aramaic portions, of course, they're far smaller. But um, I, I do think they are necessary because it's a, it's a biblical language. And it's beautiful. It's inspired by God. And I'm, yeah, it's beautiful too once you see the connections between Hebrew and Aramaic. So, right. And there's, and there's so much in, in Ezra and half of Daniel that you're missing out on if you don't get there. But, so, uh, it, you know, we live in such an age, there's so many opportunities and resources that you don't have to go the traditional classroom route to study it. And there's some great uh, alternatives out there. And hopefully we'll be able to talk more about those on this, uh, this channel in coming days and weeks. And uh, some folks involved with that, hopefully, but uh, but really glad to have you today and, and talking about uh, your motivations here. And, and again, I really appreciate your passion for the languages. But as we know, passion is, is good, but you've got to keep moving. You've got to keep things going. And sometimes the way we learn may affect that for positive uh, or for negative. Uh, would you like to speak to anything about methods of learning that you found useful in your journey of studying Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek? Uh, yeah, there. Hmm. You have to take the methods that are presented to you, just like in life. Uh, in any uh, any teacher has a method, and so I'm. Uh, I think it was a couple years ago, Doctor Plummer. Um, you know, tactfully said that what is the best greek grammar that we should be using and he said the one that you have and i really appreciate that uh statement same with methodology language uh you know pedagogy and also uh, for the student for learning you have to take what you have um i i would say though that there are um being beings created by god there are less efficient and more efficient ways of learning anything frankly um and uh, so, yeah, there, there are a couple different ways that one could learn biblical languages or modern languages. I personally love uh, figuring out the easiest ways to learn because I want to learn vocab faster so that I can read sooner. And uh, for me, I love pictures. Um, I don't love translation as much, but I love beautiful pictures, just like my daughter always looks at on her bookshelves. She, she's looking at beautiful picture books in English. And so I think pictures are wonderful for language learning. Acting is very wonderful. And lots of uh, oral and aural, or aural and oral uh, practice, personally. Uh, but it always has to be connected to reading. Because that's the ultimate goal for biblical study students, for any Christian. Um, it's to read biblical texts. And for perhaps nerds like us to read beyond the Bible, uh, read outside, maybe other, uh, you know, languages just for fun. But the primary focus is the word of God. And so uh, for me, that's uh, I whatever helps me to uh, get to reading um, the fastest and most comfortably is the method that I want to choose. Something I'm hearing you say uh, with all this, the involvement of the oral and the aural senses uh, and th those strategies and the reading and everything. It sounds like a very holistic type of approach to learning you're uh, saying is helpful here. Yeah, I, I would say that it's a joy to use for those of us who are given the, the gift of listening. Some people can't listen. Some mm -hmm. people can't speak. Some people can't act and some people can't see. But for those of us who, by God, have providentially been gifted all of these beautiful gifts, um, I, I love using everything that God gives us for language learning because I realize language learning is so difficult for some people, actually for pretty much everybody. There are some who 
just have so much passion and they can make it through, you know, even if they're going through 10 feet of snow, they don't care. They're making it to the end. Um, but then there's others who are like 10 feet of snow. I'm staying away. But for, for me, I see the, that a method will help even the most timid person at least take their first step into the 10 feet of snow. And, uh, and so I, yeah, I do think method is very, very important. Um, and I do, appreciate using as many senses as possible to be able to teach languages, whether it's modern or ancient. But my main focus is biblical Hebrew, biblical Greek, and Aramaic. And so for me, I want to be able to use every gift that God's given me to help other Christians learn uh, in the easiest possible way, but also the most joyful, uh, you know, uh, the most how should I say the methods that bring most joy to students, to Christians? So, well, in regard to those methods, then is there a particular school of of teaching that you follow, or a, a certain approach, or a blend of multiple approaches that would describe how you're trying to instruct people? Uh, maybe not a school necessarily. I am a student. I am a disciple. I try and pick anything that I think is helpful. Um, it, truly, I want language learning to be as helpful as possible, pedagogy at least. So, um, as I've mentioned, I think that uh, listening a lot to audio clips in language learning to the actual language we must listen to to be able to get comfortable with it. Because when you're reading, generally in English, when I read, uh, you read so fast, you just see the first like right. two or three words on a page. You don't even read the whole word if you're fluent in a language. You see the first three letters and you can just intuit from context what the rest of the word's going to sound like. And then your brain, by God's creative activity, just intuits the rest of the meaning from that word and you just fly through it. And so most words, I don't even read every letter on there um, as an English uh, speaker and reader. And so I think that uh, the oral aspect of language learning is wonderful. Um, and then speaking, um, you know, perhaps as I've mentioned earlier, there some people think there's controversy here, but in any language, people know that it's good to speak because you can generally um, get more comfortable with a language. But speaking, it seems to me, and I haven't done any re formal research on this, it seems to be the hardest language learning aspect to master. Um, I, it, I, I don't know. I mean, this is just my theory, but it seems like reading comes first, writing comes second, listening, and then uh, speaking. And so difficult, you know, uh, senses like, you know, or at least using your vocal cords to be able to produce a language. It's really good because it can cement the language in our head by exercising right. muscles that God has given us to be able to uh, learn that language, express that language. And so I'm I'm a strong proponent of using human speech and using uh, using our ears to learn ancient languages. But I also think that, of course, reading is the ultimate goal, but writing should be a wonderful exercise as well that helps us to fine-tune our morphology or our understanding of morphology in the biblical languages. So, Right, but that speaking that you mentioned, uh, I've not heard a lot of people talk about over the years, but I've, I've heard recently an expert, uh, Jennifer Noonan, who did research in, in these areas and uh, has done things with um, Second Language Acquisition Handbook for biblical studies, things like that. And she was talking about the phonological loop and just how when you, you get this speaking and hearing cycle going along with your reading and writing, it's just this awesome reinforcement uh, that really helps the learner. So I'm really excited to hear uh, your integration of all these things. Absolutely. I mean, I, I yeah, I learned about the phonological loop. Um, yeah, it's a really fascinating idea. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, just all of those things, it seems like sometimes Christians are wary of good scientific research done in language learning. I don't know why that is, um, I do understand that sometimes Christians can be wary of maybe secular science, um, but at the same time, I do think that there's a lot of good benefits that we can glean as Christians from any scientific discipline, especially linguistics or second language acquisition, as people say. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, die on a hill 
uh, you know, for those who don't agree with the, you know, the science of second language acquisition. I don't really care. I just love to see people joyful when they're learning. Even if I don't tell them that's what I use as a, uh, as a, not a, a philosophy, a language, a pedagogy, a pedagogic philosophy. Um, I'm, I'm going to insert those theories through my teaching because I think that's most beneficial for them. Um, but right. I'm not going to die on any hill <laughs> just to say, yeah, the phonological loop and yeah, all this <laughs> think of language acquisition. I, I don't really care. The students ne don't need to necessarily know about all of my theories or other right. theories. As long as they're learning from a well-refined pedagogy, I think that that's going to really benefit students. Right. And that joy of learning that you're talking about, uh, what's the term, the the effective filter and the, the effective domain where you know, our affections are stirred by the experience we have uh, with instruction in these languages. Absolutely. I mean, you have no idea when I bring my two year old daughter in to a Hebrew class, which is only in spoken biblical Hebrew. Um, she I tell her to stand. She's standing on this table right next to me. And, uh, and I tell her to sit and then she sits down and all the students laugh and they're like, oh, your daughter, she's literally listening to you in Hebrew. And for me, it's, it's not just an experiment. It's a, it's a serious task of teaching people the biblical languages so that they won't forget. And I yes. want people to not waste money in seminary, but remember forever. And I, I'm convinced that listening to a language, watching my little daughter sit down and stand up, they grasp, they intuit from the context what's going on. They hear and they find great joy and they're laughing. I mean, it's so fun to have those opportunities where my students are laughing because those are the memorable moments. And even if they can't remember a translation of a Hebrew word, in 10 years, they're going to look back and be like, oh, what's the word for to stand up in biblical Hebrew? My teacher, Sawyer Moranville, he said it to his daughter one time, Humi, you know, he said it, it 10 years ago and I still remember. And so I think that that's beautiful and it's uh, just a very effective way for helping people to learn uh, the biblical languages. So, you know, Jesus said to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to become like a little child, right? And it seems like to really enjoy and learn the biblical languages, we could apply that as well, right? You need to just just enter in this just as a child, just soaking it up all all in and, and enjoying it here in, in humility and and just uh, just drinking from the hose here. Mm -hmm, absolutely, and yeah, I mean, I I don't think as you've mentioned, there's different methodologies, different you know ideas for how to best teach. I don't think we should bring disunity to the church over a matter like this. Yes. I think both parties should be humble. I think both parties should say there's benefits in both or maybe more than both. Maybe there's a number of different methods. We should glean what's best from every and not become sectarian. And, mm -hmm. you know, become, I'm the I'm the communicative language party guy. Uh, I'm the, you know, grammar translation party guy. I'm the Republican. I'm the Democrat. I'm the like, I don't care about parties here. Um, if it comes to biblical languages, I want to take the best from everybody and give it to the people of God so that they can discern what's best and so that they can reflect upon what was most effective for them in learning the biblical languages. So it seems like with that, too, you've got this, you know, you've got the teacher and you've got the, the skill set, the background, the training and, and so forth. Hopefully also a humility that, you know, would be open to pursuing some other things that could be helpful. But then you've also got the student, the student's culture, the student's background and abilities and so forth. And would you say, I think I've heard um, uh, Peter Williams talking about uh, pedagogical pluralism. <laughs> would you say there's something to that? And what is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, yeah. To simply put it, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be nearly as succinct and beautiful in my expression of, you know, <laughs> you know, as, as the professor that you mentioned um, has put it, but, I do think that we we shouldn't get stuck in a rut in one mm -hmm. sense. Like I, I want to use what is most beneficial. And if some new theory uh, you know, arises from some party, some group of people, some group of teachers that they think, oh, this is the next hot thing in language pedagogy, 
Well, I'll I'll listen to it. I'll I'll figure out if I like it. If I think it's truly beneficial, I'll try and practice it in my classes. Um, and if it is the next top thing, then I'm like, let's do it. But if it if I don't see that it actually affects the joy of my students, I'm not going to implement it. Uh, so yeah, I do think that we should be cautious with Im implementing new methods. Um, would you call it a pedagogical pluralism? Yes, <laughs> not 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 a theological pluralism, but a yeah. pedagogical <laughs> pluralism. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. we we believe in the orthodox doctrines of the historic Christian faith, uh, but at least when it comes to teaching languages, I. Um, I am willing to waver a little, but I'm not willing to waver with my doctrine, right? But my pedagogical doctrine, if we may term it that way, right? Um, I, I think that we should be listening to other voices. Um, and I think that there's a lot of room for us to learn from perhaps ancient, perhaps there's ancient teachers, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, any language, really, um, there's, I'm sure there's people in any age who have written about how to best teach um, either uh, doctrine or language or philosophy or other things. Um, and so I think we should take from every party when it comes to uh, instruction, language instruction, and use yes. what's best. And at least practice it. Don't, you know, don't get like the, oh, like that's scary just because, you know, there's a new a new party of people who are saying this is a new method and this is the best method. I, you know, I don't want to, you know, I, f I feel like we should be careful with throwing out terms like this is the best best method. And it could be yes. very, it, it could bring disunity. And I just don't like that. I think we should be very careful with our language um, as well and be very compassionate and uh, gracious. There's a, a big historical tradition of the grammar translation uh, pedagogy in, in our uh, seminaries and schools all across the globe. And we should be very gracious to every language teacher across the globe who uses any method. I don't care what it is. And uh, we should seek to find the best, uh, maybe as you were mentioning, the, the gold nuggets in, in their uh, pedagogy and take them and use them um, and be thankful to God for them. Right. I really appreciate your heart and uh, and the way you think about that, Brother Sawyer. The um, the methods we've been been talking about that for a bit and sort of how we approach things. Uh, I want to take just a few minutes and and ask you what your thoughts are about just materials for learning biblical Hebrew and biblical Aramaic and biblical Greek. Just some of the tools that you found useful or that you uh, would recommend, and it can be you know whatever you'd like to share, whether it's for absolute beginners, people just continuing on in the language, uh, resources for teachers. Mm, that's a great question. Those are three different languages, so I'm going to have to filter through what are the best yeah. resources in each one. I'll yeah, well, we'll pick one if you want to just do Hebrew today. We can, uh, Hebrew. We can do mean, this again yeah. sometime. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Hebrew, for instance, there's hmm, – that's a great question. I mean, there's a number of online resources, both free and, you know, paid, that are really wonderful. I think that uh, – um, I'm sure anybody who's delved into biblical Hebrew at all now knows about Olive with Bet, uh, Andrew and Bethany Case. Yes. Um, they do wonderful work, and it's all free. They don't they don't try and get any kind of money through ads on YouTube. They try and take every barrier out of the way of uh, enjoyable language learning. They want to make sure that people aren't you know clogged up by ads and other things like that. So they they take off their ads. They don't get any money from this. Um, and they teach people biblical Hebrew through listening uh, at first and obviously visual because you're watching a video and you listen a lot. And then they start introducing this script to the writing on, on the screen. So I think that is so effective. I don't know how many videos now they're up to, maybe 150 plus. I mean, the amount, a lot. the amount of hours that they've put in for not even having this as a business, they're getting no money out of it except for donations from Christians who love what they're doing. And so they're not, you know, and I really appreciate the heart behind it. They're not in it for the money. They just want people to learn. And that's really beautiful. Um, besides that, there's a lot of things. There's a, a paid uh, program called Biblingo. They have some wonderful, wonderful videos online. I've gone through some of their Greek and Hebrew uh, um, materials, and they also have a number of different uh, pronunciations of 
uh, ancient Greek. I mean, they have a modern Greek pronunciation, I think. Koine Greek, reconstructed Greek, you know, all, all of these different, Erasmian, they have a dent, uh, many different pronunciations. For Hebrew, they have, I believe, modern Hebrew, and yeah, maybe a classical Hebrew pronunciation, maybe more. I'm, I can't right, remember. Right, so even accommodating those uh, those variances yeah. among people, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that is wonderful. What else do you have? You have uh, websites like the Biblical Language Center, uh, which has online uh, materials. Randall Booth is the father of many disciples, not many nations, but at least many disciples in that. Um, I, I learned myself from Dr. Booth in Israel, um, and I thought his methods are wonderful. Um, BLC has it produces some wonderful things. They have online live video classes that I've really appreciated. I've done many in the past myself. Um, and Scott McQuinn is an amazing teacher through them as well right now, a good friend of mine. Um, let me see what else. If I could pause you on Scott McQuinn for just a second. I've been reading his thesis and really glad to see that, that he made that uh, available. Absolutely. And actually, I was talking to Scott. He, at the request of Andrew Case through All of With Bet, um, Andrew said, hey, if you release this for free to the globe, it's going to have a huge impact compared to if you you know, bind it with money and make people pay for it. So he opened it up to the the entire globe and gave it as, a, you know, a beautiful gift to the global church um, on, you know, his master's thesis, as you said, at Fresno Pacific University. And uh, Scott is a wonderful guy and um, a great teacher. Um, and he's done some wonderful, wonderful things with uh, the Biblical Language Center as well. Um, and then... The BLC also has Greek. What, what else? I mean, there's so many different things nowadays. I'm trying to think of books that I've studied in the past. On my shelf over here, there's Athanase, which is uh, perhaps more of a, a little bit before the time of biblical Koine Greek, but there is uh, Athanase is a wonderful book. The Italian edition is a wonderful book for learning um, uh, ancient Greek, and it's similar to Hans Orberg's wonderful book, uh, uh, Familia Romana, um, yes. Lingua Latina per se illustrata as it is in his Latin method is just so beautiful. Uh, right. It just takes you step by step. Doesn't just introduce his vocab with some pictures and it just keeps you yeah. just going right through learning the language in the language. Absolutely. And so Athanase is kind of like, uh, they're almost copycats of the Lingua or, uh, Familia Romana, Hans Orberg, but for Greek. And I love that. I mean, I think right. it was when I went through the Familia Romana, I was blown away. It was an amazing book. I mean, that man spent probably 40 years of his life mastering that, and he did a great job. I was going to ask you, um, speaking of uh, Hans Orberg uh, type approach there with the lingua, lingua Latina, did that influence uh, some of the work you're doing? I'd like to hear some things about what you've been doing with uh, Lingua Deo Gloria. I saw that you've got a Jonah reader, you've got a vocabulary book. Could, could you tell uh, the folks listening and watching uh, about what uh, what you're doing there? Yeah, that's actually funny that you mentioned that because now I, I reflect upon my labors this last year and I realize that most of it is dependent upon Hans Orberg as well. Um, so what I started out as uh, and with Lingua Deo Gloria was uh, a ministry to be able to serve the church with free resources, um, whether it's for those who can't afford it, even for those who can. I don't care. I wanted to make good, beautiful biblical language products as accessible as possible to the globe. And so that's why on every single page, for instance, um, here's one of my new books. It's a children's book of biblical Hebrew. Uh, you will see something like this. It's a freely given badge. And what does that mean? It says here, this work is freely given. All of this publication may be shared, translated, sold, or copied freely without limitation and without permission. Um, and to learn more about this license, go to copy.church slash free. Why do I put that in there? Because I want to give wings to wonderful materials. I don't want to put chains on blessed, beautiful things. God has gifted me so many things in my life, and I am so grateful, first off, for salvation in Christ Jesus and all of the blessings of the church and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And God has freely given us His Son, and for me, it's just 
It's a no-brainer. I want to give freely back to God's people and imitate God in his wonderful gift giving. And so that's why I put that on there. Anybody, let's say in Cambodia, if there's a group of Christians who love what I'm producing, they can go to my website, take the PDF, print it off in their own country, and they never have to talk to me. They don't have to ask me anything. They don't have to say, Sawyer, can we borrow your materials? Go ahead. Don't even mention my name. I don't care. I want the church to be served, and I don't want me to be a roadblock to see that being accomplished. I appreciate your heart in that, brother. That's uh, this is great to hear your enthusiasm to serve in this way and to to help teach people and provide these materials. I've already enjoyed uh, learning from some of them myself, uh, using some of them. Uh, I teach high schoolers uh, biblical Hebrew, and we've been able to to bring start bringing some things in there. And I got to have some kindergartners come visit us the other day. And so it's just wow. it's just neat to have. It's such a blessing to have these opportunities to share with people in all kinds of different contexts. Wow, you're teaching high school Hebrew. That is amazing. That's uh, you have probably one of a kind job in the country. That's incredible. How fun! So <laughs> one one aspect of it, but uh, it's a uh, it's a wonderful aspect of it for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, brother, I appreciate you joining us uh, today on the program. Uh, any any final encouragements that you would have uh, to our guests, maybe especially to those that are trepidatious about starting into Hebrew or just, you know, wondering, you know, maybe it's that person's like, maybe I need to go to a different degree or maybe, um, you know, I'm about to enter seminary, Bible college. I'm thinking about some programs and I, I, w- I want to be ready. Do you think there are some things like the things you mentioned that could just kind of help them ramp up to it? Uh, just just any words of encouragement or uh, practical advice you'd give them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will, believe it or not, Duolingo is great. I know we're talking about biblical Hebrew here, but their modern Hebrew program, if you just want to get used to a modern pronunciation, the alphabet, words, there's significant overlap between modern and ancient Hebrew. And so, personally, a woman in my church, she's in her 70s, she, for the first time in her life, finished the whole Hebrew Bible. It took her like 40 years She took, I think, 20 or 30 years off in the middle, and she read the Hebrew Bible, and she's been telling me every Sunday, she asked me little Hebrew grammar questions about Duolingo or other things that she's doing. And she says, Sawyer, Duolingo has skyrocketed my ability to comfortably read the Hebrew Bible. And of course, as language learners, we need to be careful because modern Hebrew on every point isn't like biblical Hebrew. However, I think it would be a good foundation. It would teach you the alphabet. It would teach you foundational words, sus, sade, bite, all of these simple words that you have in daily life. They're the same in modern Hebrew as in biblical Hebrew. And on top of that, though, I would, I would encourage, yeah, those, um, you know, listening to, as I said, Olive with Bet Biblinga, wonderful resources that engage your senses and that are appealing, attractive, that will draw you to the language. And um, don't just use a book. If you're if you're preparing for a seminary class, don't just use a book. That's great. I have many on a shelf over here. I have Greek, Hebrew, Latin, French, you know, so many other grammar books. Um, but I would encourage you to find more than just a grammar. And uh, find a buddy as well. Language learning with other people is one of the most fun things that you can do, or at least the most strengthening, because as your friend is getting weary, you can say, take heart, brother. (laughs) And, uh, you know, he can do, he or she can do the same to you. And so I think that there's a lot of great uh, work that is done when you're doing it with a friend. Um, And so... I, I I can't go through every single thing, but I think those are two very important things. Oh, my ode. <laughs> These are some great, uh, great points uh, to bring across. So, yeah, yeah jump in with uh, those resources that you mentioned. Uh, Olive with Beth, Biblingo, uh, get us some Duolingo, some modern Hebrew going there. Find a buddy. Yeah, those are, are some great things, brother. Thank you again for joining us today on the program and helping us in this effort to encourage people in studying the biblical languages. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me on. And um, yeah, it's uh, such a such a pleasure to be with you today. 